Hi, this is Theory Station. I'm John Duggan. This program is Rational Choice Modeling. The installment we're in is the Basic Formal Theory Toolkit, and this is, insta this is installment 14 in the series. I just finished a long installment about public good provision, and uh, I'm just going to continue with that in this one. So again, it's public good provision. which was a, um, a generalization or extension of the cost-benefit problem. But now we have two decision makers solving their cost-benefit problems um, by choosing activity levels, uh, and they're doing it simultaneously. And so we talked about the idea of a Nash equilibrium, and we started to understand or characterize what these Nash equilibria would have to look like. And we showed that any equilibrium with positive activity levels would have to be symmetric. Okay, so um, the, the first order conditions for the decision makers problems that we looked at was the following. Um, but remember, we also showed that this equilibrium has to be symmetric. Okay, so in fact, um, let's just, since the two activity levels are the same, we don't have to have subscripts on them anymore. Let's just use X bar for the symmetric equ or the equilibrium activity level of both of the um, decision makers. Okay, so that means that this first first order condition reduces to the following. In fact, I'll just pull out this one plus beta. And the second first order condition reduces to the same expression. Um, so really, we've just argued that that system of two equations and two unknowns can be collapsed to a system of just one, I guess it's a system, to one equation and one unknown. Okay, and that equation um, characterizes that equilibrium activity level. So um, now, actually, I, the phrasing I was using was that there's a unique equilibrium. Um, we don't know that quite yet, but we will in just a minute. Um, I want to argue that um, that this equation that I've just written can have at most one solution. And here I'm, um, I haven't proven that it does have one, but you know, that's easy enough to take care of. With other arguments, we need to impose a little structure on the problem. But I wanna just focus on this claim here that there's at most one solution to this. And, and that would mean that there is at most one symmetric Nash equilibrium. So why is this claim true? I'm just gonna draw a picture for it. So um, that's uh, pictures are not, you know, they're not real rigorous proofs, but uh, for something like this, it's enough. So on the horizontal axis, I'll have x bar. And um, now I'm going to graph, well, let's do marginal cost first. We're assuming that marginal cost is increasing. So this marginal cost function as a function of x bar looks something like that, right? Um, the marginal benefit function we're assuming is decreasing. And so if I write marginal benefit as a function of one plus beta times x bar, that's gonna be decreasing. Well, if I have an increasing function and a decreasing function, the graphs of those two functions can only cross in one, at, at most one point. Um, that means that this equation that I've circled up here can have at most one solution. Um, so, in fact, 
there is at most one uh, symmetric Nash equilibrium. Again, <clears throat> we can impose more structure to make sure there is one. So basically, there's a unique equilibrium in this model. So we've shown there's at most one Nash equilibrium. And um, this is symmetric. All right, and I'll use that X bar notation um, to denote that equilibrium uh, activity level. All right, <clears throat> so here we've, we've been talking at a fairly general level, really. Um, it, this gives you an idea of how really you can just impose a little structure on the problem about the shape of the benefit and cost functions. And from that structure, you can extract implications that tell you something about interaction between rational decision makers. Um, let me, um, let's put some meat on the bones and go through an example uh, with explicit functional forms. So in this example, uh, let's assume that the benefit function is just uh, the natural log function. And uh, let's assume that the cost function is linear. Um, so here, gamma, that's the Greek letter gamma. That's just some fixed parameter, and we'll assume that it's strictly positive. Right, so that's a cost parameter. Um, all right, so we have the, um, this equation that characterizes the equilibrium activity level. And um, that was the following. It was B prime one plus beta x bar equal to C prime x bar. OK. So with these functional forms, we just um, can rewrite this. Um, derivative of natural log of x is 1 over x. And so um, that's going to be uh, 1 over 1 plus beta x bar. And um, this marginal cost is just going to be uh, gamma. OK, so that means that uh, with these functional forms, if we solve for x bar, um, that's going to be 1 over 1 plus beta gamma. Um, Okay, so simple solution. Um, it's always a good idea to, when you derive something like this, just go back and play around with it and make sure it does what it should or what, what it feels like it should do. Um, so notice if we uh, increase gamma, then um, we're making the denominator bigger. So x bar, this equilibrium activity level is gonna go down. Um, that's intuitive. Um, as this cost parameter goes gets higher, effort becomes more costly, um, and yeah, okay, makes sense that if effort's more costly, we'll do less of it in equilibrium. Um, so, as well, if beta gets big, um, then x bar goes down. Um, now here, you might not have intuition about this, but remember beta is how much one person cares about the effort of the other. Um, so a, a term that's used here is, I um, uh, should have mentioned this before, but in, in this problem, because we're allowing for one person's activity level to affect the other person's cost-benefit problem, that's called an externality. Right? One person's decision affects uh, someone else. And um, in fact, here, it's a positive externality because if I exert more effort or contribute more, the other person is, their benefit goes up. So there's a positive externality. Um, And beta is controlling the uh, extent of that externality, okay? 
if beta is zero, there's no externality at all, and if beta is higher, uh, the externality is bigger. Uh, so what we've shown is that when this externality gets bigger, then the equilibrium, you know, so I'm, I'm getting more benefit from what the other guy is doing. In equilibrium, my activity level will go down. I don't think that that I don't think that there really is a um, an obvious intuition for that if you haven't thought about these problems before. Um, this is something that you get out of the equilibrium analysis, and um, you know it's again this is what we call a comparative static, and this might show you well it might reveal something about these problems that you wouldn't have expected um, a priori. Um, the idea though is that. If the other person is um, doing more, let, let's think about it this way. Suppose we increase beta. Is it possible that the equilibrium effort level or activity level of both of these decision, ma decision makers goes up? Well, it can't happen because let's suppose I'm decision maker one. Suppose my externality gets bigger and now we're both choosing higher activity levels, but that means the other guy is choosing a higher activity level. And um, it means that, well, because he's doing more, I can slack off more, okay? Um, he's thinking the same thing, and um, it can't be that we both end up increasing our activity levels. Um, each person would then think, oh, but the other guy's doing more, so I can actually slack off. Okay, so that, that can't happen. In fact, um, when the externality increases, the equilibrium activity level goes down. Um, so I want to argue that that's a bad thing. Um, now, that's a normative statement. Um, and, you know, most normative statements um, are subjective and they... they rest on some kind of a, a judgment about um, you know what's good or or moral or or what what welfare social welfare means or something but here I'm gonna just make a a statement that's really um, not subjective because I'm gonna talk about Pareto optimality okay so remember in the um, in the multi-dimensional policy choice model, we said that um, a pair of positions was Pareto optimal if uh, the only way you could make one person better off was by making the other person worse off. Okay. If a, a pair of policy positions is not Pareto optimal, that means you can make one person better off without hurting the other guy so clearly, if something's not Pareto optimal, it's not a, um, it's not really a normatively justifiable choice. One way to see just in this little example that, um, that these guys are choosing an inefficiently low activity level is, um, well, let's think about the, um, the equilibrium net benefit of one of these decision makers, okay? So in general, the equilibrium net benefit, let me do that up here, that's just the benefit when um, I'm choosing X bar and you're choosing X bar, minus the cost of my choosing X bar. So that's the equilibrium uh, net benefit. In this public good provision um, problem, well, so, we can look at that equilibrium net benefit expression and say, um, you know, what happens if we increase X bar, if we increase the activity level of both of these guys, okay? So, um, you know, we can just do that at a, in a general way by taking the derivative of that with respect to X bar, um, all right? so. So we're going to differentiate this. Let 
with respect to x bar, the whole thing. Well, um, that's going to be uh, Marshall benefit times one plus beta minus C prime X bar. And um, right, so this expression here, that's going to tell us how the net benefits of these two decision makers change as they both increase their activity level, okay? And I'm going to argue that, um, that that's positive. In this example, you can just see that directly by plugging in, um, right? So in the example, um, you know, the, the marginal benefit is just the, the log, so that would be um, 1 over 1 plus beta times x bar, and um, we're multiplying by 1 plus beta here, okay? Um, the cost is linear, so the marginal cost is just gamma, but of course the 1 plus betas, um, those cancel out, okay? So this, um, this just reduces to 1 over x bar minus gamma. So in our example, um, this expression gives us the rate of change of net benefit for both these guys if we were to increase x bar for both of them. I claim that that's positive, and you can just plug in our expression for x bar. We already solved for that equilibrium effort level. You can plug that into um, this derivative, right? So that's 1 over but that's just 1 plus beta times gamma minus gamma. Now, remember, if beta is equal to 0, there's no externality, so there's nothing to be done. But when beta is positive, this thing is equal to beta times gamma. That's positive. So that's how you know we can show in this example that um, both decision makers could be better off if they just could both increase uh, their activity levels. Obviously, the, the weird thing about that is that conceptually they could. There's no problem with them increasing their activity levels. It's just that they don't have the incentive to do so. Um, right? If the other guy were increasing their activity level, then I would just want to decrease mine. So that's the idea of um, sort of under provision of public goods, um, the idea that equilibrium incentives can lead to um, Pareto inefficient outcomes. Uh, we're going a bit long on this installment, so I want to pick this up in the next one, and I want to um, just be a little bit more uh, formal and um, general about these claims. Um, this really is, you know, it's up there as one of the really fundamental models of interaction, um, and I, I think it's it's a good for illustrating ideas, um, but also showing how models are used and how we can derive insights from them. So we'll continue that in the next one, and I'll see you there.